Of course, the first couple of sentences in the story is, is not new. Uh, you had a man some years ago whose name was Diogenes. Diogenes is known to have walked the streets of Athens with a lit lantern, you know, looking for a just human being, a human being who is honest and sincere. <clears throat> and then they tell him that no such human being could ever be found. And so he throws down his lit lantern and goes back into his tub, uh, bathtub, that's where he lived. And then, of course, a few years later, like about 600 years or 400 years later, a man named Rumi comes forth and he borrows from this wonderful story, but he turns it into his own story, which is this time Diogenes is, is there with a lit lantern in broad daylight, not looking for a just, honest human being, but he's looking for a human being, period. Not someone who simply has a shell of a human being, but someone who acts like a human being. And for those of you who want to know how a human being should act, you got to read six books of Rumi's poetry in Persian, not in English. <coughs> and uh, <laughs> so I suppose Nietzsche borrows from uh, the Greek story of Diogenes. Uh, a couple of things before we continue. First is, why would someone turn on a flashlight at 10 in the morning when there is sun out, when the day is good? Uh, why would someone in this class sit, raise their hand and say, despite being in this room for about 10 weeks, say, will anyone in this class be my friend? 10 weeks in this room, all these people asking questions, you gaze into other people's eyes, you look at them, they look at you, so once in a while you touch shoulders perhaps, you break bread, and yet after 10 weeks you raise your hand and you say, can anyone be my, my friend? So the first thing that you need to understand is Diogenes, or this madman, who has turned his flashlight on, that even when there is light out there, it's still pretty dark. Even if you live in a room filled with people, you're still lonely. Even if you live in a country such as this, where there are Costco's everywhere, you still feel poor and impoverished. And even though you have a home, you feel homeless. That's a devastating place to be. <clears throat> and then, uh, in addition to having your flashlight be on, he also screams that I'm looking for God. Now, if you look at the history of God and God's relationship to human being or human beings relationship to God, if I ask you as a religious person, what do you think about life? You say, life is a veil of tears. I didn't choose to come down here. It was an accident. It was an unfortunate event that took place some years ago. Life here on earth does not provide happiness, does not provide comfort or solace. It's a place of condemnation. It's a prison for the human being, for his body, for his soul, for his mind. It's a rat race. If you ask a religious person, how should one behave um, in life as long as you live? They say, well, there's the Ten Commandments. Do you have sex before marriage? No, God says no sex before marriage. Do you drink? No, I don't drink. Do you smoke? No, I don't smoke. Well, why not? Well, God says no. Do you steal? No, I don't steal. Do you put your parents in a nursing home? No, why? Well, honor thy parents. And you realize that just a simple word or a simple concept, God, it has layers upon layers of meaning connected to human life and the human psyche. And when this man says, I have lost God, he's not simply saying that I've lost a concept. I have lost my GPS to life. What should I believe in? How should I act? Is there a church I can go to? Is there a GPS to life? What else should I do with the few years that I am alive? It's a devastating place to be. And I think Nietzsche was right. Let's use his own words against him, that the words of the philosopher is the identity of the philosopher. This is not the story of a madman. This is a story about Friedrich Nietzsche slowly 
moving towards becoming mad because he wants to hold on to something, find meaning in something, and yet he can't find meaning in anything. Okay. <clears throat> now, the third or the fourth aspect of the story is that people look at him and they're in shock. <coughs> And they laugh at him. Imagine any of you in this class ever running into this a psychological problem or an issue that you have, and you go to the closest people to you and you tell them about your difficulties, and perhaps you're looking for com uh, compassion, for sympathy, empathy. <coughs> Instead, all you get is laughter, and they harass you with their jokes. They make fun of you. <clears throat> you know, it's like a comment made by Donald Trump some years ago when it came to um, McCain, John McCain, that he was a political prisoner and Trump, who's never served, instead of showing com some compassion, understanding, insight, just being a decent human being, he says, I don't like people who were captured in war. You know, <clears throat> and that's exactly what Friedrich Nietzsche talks about. <sighs> that you have a man and you see this man clearly in pain. He's saying, can someone out there give me some meaning to life? Perhaps put my relationship back together with life and people just laugh at you because they don't really have the issues that you do. They don't see things the way you do. They don't see that how important perhaps the presence of God is in human society, in human beings' search for meaning and identity and purpose, that human beings are far too insufficient to kind of create their own GPS, <sighs> that you need to have fear in life. And uh, fear, some fears can actually be quite healthy and quite beneficial to human existence. Uh, but you know, this man who tries to understand why others are making fun of him, tries to kind of be patient, tries to be forgiving at a certain point. He has no patience left in him. He picks up his lantern and he bangs it. Uh, I'm sorry, he's not there yet. He looks at the people and he says, I know you guys are making fun of me, which is not nice, but let me tell you what has happened to God. We have killed him. Imagine for a moment that I'm telling you the story and let's just say I'm extremely passionate about rendering the story and I'm not, quite monotone and boring. And I'm screaming and shouting and my soul is out there on the table for all to see and someone from the back raises their hand and says, Professor, is that going to be on the quiz tomorrow? And I say, the hell? You know, I'm living inside the story and expressing myself through the story and there is an idiot sitting in the back asking if it's going to be on the quiz. I don't care about the quiz. I don't care about your question. And imagine for a moment that day after day after day after day for years, just people in the back keep asking me, Professor, is that going to be on the quiz? Is this going to be on the quiz? Uh, do I need to cite my sources? And after a while you say, man, you know what? I'm just going to go to class and turn my back to my students and just write things on the board and then go home. You know? So there comes a point where this man comes to realize that the people around him don't really care. And really, it is difficult to care. I don't know why I'm angry, but my first 12 marriages, you know, I kept demanding my wives to be patient. There comes a point you just give up and you just walk away. 
And there came a point where this man looks at his audience and says, I'll tell you what we have done. We have killed God, you and I. By ridiculous questions, by giving in to capitalism. Everything's about a profit. Everything is about winning an argument. Having these ridiculous infantile positions about this and that. Um, and if you look at the palms of your hand, you realize it's red, and it's red because there is blood on it. And if you want to know whose blood it is, it's the blood of God. And if you begin to smell things very closely, you realize there is this awful smell that's everywhere, and it's God's body. It's his body decomposing. <sighs> I'm not quite sure at what stage in our culture we stopped worshiping uh, Malcolm X and we begin to make Jay-Z a hero. You know, I don't know at what stage Mother Teresa was replaced with Kim Kardashian. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know at, at what stage that the usage of drugs for enlightenment, at least for some experience, became a thing of scape and entertainment. And when you kind of look at all the stuff, you realize there is nothing about our culture that holds anything sacred anymore. And freedom means freedom of every awful perspective out there and every human activity out there because they all have equal value because you have to respect individuals and their decision-making and their decision-making abilities. So what you have is crap all over the place. But there comes a point where this madman just can no longer contain himself. Uh, he throws down the lantern and he says, you know what, I think I have come far too early. It seems that thunder also requires time to reach the ears of men. You know, it's like your mom, your dad telling you this is the wrong person to go out with. This is the wrong drugs to experiment with. You want to take an Advil because you have a headache, fine. LSD, hashish, cocaine, I'm not quite sure. To relieve a simple headache, you know. Well, you don't listen and you don't listen and it doesn't matter how loud and thunderous your parents may be, eventually they'll give up and they say, son, it's okay, I'm just going to walk away, but remember my voice and remember my screamings and remember my heartache. Eventually time will teach you exactly what I told you. And that's exactly what the madman says to his audience, that it needs time for people to understand their mistakes, cultural mistakes, personal mistakes. And then... Uh, he walks to the nearest church and he sings the mass for the dead. And he says the church is no longer a place where you celebrate God having resurrected. We have killed God, our culture has, our narratives have, our human activities have, our TikTok and YouTube, our educational system, our politicians, everything and everyone comes together to destroy anything that's sacred about life. And so he says, the church is now the tomb of God. We go there to celebrate. You know, it's something that Pascal had said some centuries before Nietzsche, which was, you know, the church has allowed sin, has allowed ignorance, has allowed stupidity to be continuous. You know, you go to the church and you repent and you confess, hoping that you will never repeat the same mistake. But now the church has a different function. Be an idiot from Monday to Saturday, do all sorts of things, but there's a way out. You can go to church on Sunday, pray for a few hours, maybe you know, shed some fake tears, and then assume that God has forgiven you and go back into life and be the nice capitalist, be the nice consumerist piece of crap you've always been. So what is a soul? Well, for those of us now who live in 2023, in a culture that gives us nothing to believe in. So let's, before talking about a soul, let's talk about consciousness. Uh, I don't know what other people have said about consciousness. I've never taken a psychology class uh, or a philosophy class. <laughs> Thank you. 
Imagine you go to a cafeteria and you want to get yourself a cup of coffee. You don't directly go to the coffee container. You go to the place where the cups are and then you grab yourself a cup and a lid. When you look inside the cup, it's empty. And you can, from that point on, you look at the buffet presented to you, you can put cereal in your cup, you can put milk in your cup, you could put half and half in the cup, coffee in the cup, fill it up with sugar, or just take the cup empty as it is, put the lid on it, take it home and put dirt in it. Consciousness, therefore, I think, is nothing but this empty container. And depending on where you live and the sort of advertisements in your life, little by little, this cup is going to get filled with advertisements. <sighs> Human beings did not believe in happiness for the longest time in our history. All of a sudden appeared from nowhere. And the sort of happiness that came from nowhere really was invented um, maybe around the 18th, 19th century, that you don't need to wait to die to find moments of pleasure or happiness. You can find them down here. Buy yourself a big house. Get yourself married to a man or a woman that you love. Have children and create these ridiculous fantasies in your head that your kids are going to be like Einstein and Mother Teresa. You know, and believe in yourself and love yourself. And uh, the version, this particular version of happiness became very meaty, very secular. And for the first time, you believe that life owes you things, owes you happiness, owes you comfort, owes you success. And just in case life doesn't pan out the things that you expected life to give you, now you throw a temper tantrum. And then you go to therapy to kind of iron out the wrinkles. You read books and you go on these YouTube clips and um, find the quickest way to be happy, to make money, to do this and to do that. Because after all, we're human beings and life owes us happiness and all that. I don't know how many of you in this class have had your coffee. I don't know how many of you in this class like coffee, but you didn't have time to get yourself a cup of coffee. And the more I say the word coffee, 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 no doubt, you'll be half here and half uh, in at Pete's coffee shop. And the moment this class is over, you'll run to Pete's coffee and grab yourself a bucket of coffee and drink the whole thing. In Iran, I would see my parents pray all the time. Then I would see my grandparents pray all the time. Then when we would go to gatherings, it was all about conversations about politics and religion. You walk the streets, you see women in religious traditional garments. There are mosques everywhere. There are speakers and you hear the call to prayer in Arabic and it's beautiful. And you see men uh, with beard and they have wrinkles and every wrinkle has a story to tell and for the most part it's religious stories. And life is difficult for everyone. And you see Persian calligraphy, Quranic uh, poets of Hafez and Rumi on the walls everywhere. And you realize that you are born in a culture from the moment your eyes open. This is just what you intake 24-7. And there are only two TV channels. One is about religion and the other is about religion and politics. You don't see people holding hands. You don't see people expressing affection in the streets. Those are private things done in the private space. And so there is this etiquette <clears throat> that when you walk the streets, there's a way you should dress, there's a way you should talk, there's a way you should express yourself. You're not free to just go out there and tell everybody how ignorant and stupid and idiotic you are. That's reserved for the privacy of your own four walls. <coughs> and that's the thing that has been advertised to me. 
And so when sometimes I ask, do I have a soul? There is this culture that lives inside me and it's lived inside me for the past, I don't know, 50, 60 years. And it's very organic for me. <clears throat> then, of course, you come to America and you realize, well, there is a different way to be and there's a way, different way to think about things. I don't have to inject religious components or seasoning into every aspect of life. I can turn things secular once in a while. Sacred can become secular. Profound can become profane and there is nothing wrong with it. And all of a sudden what you have is an Amir Abzawari, a 60-year-old man who lives in two worlds. A sacred world that was <coughs> formed back home and a secular world that was imposed upon me or formed here in the past 30, 40 years of living here. And there are moments I become religious, sometimes I like it, sometimes it disrupts my secular life, and there are moments I become secular, and I realize I've become all meat and no spirit, and I begin to despise who and what I've become, and yet there is no way out. <sighs> Do I have a soul? I don't know if I have a soul, but I'll uh, maybe give it to you in this way. There are lots of people out there with, who advertise that human beings have a soul. There is Billy Graham, I think he's dead. There is Jerry Falwell, he's also dead. Uh, there is Jordan Peterson. He should be dead. Yes. The point is there are 20 people out there who are advertising a soul and a way you can get to your soul. I don't know if you can find anyone out there of the 20 that is remotely attractive to you. And that's something organic, that's something instinctual and intuitive. Uh, I don't know why... I begin to like certain people, you just like them. And then when you get exposed to that particular person, day after day after day after day, you realize you're purchasing without knowing that form of advertisement. And you may have been an atheist, you may have been a non-believer, but because and through, of this, through this advertisement, slowly you begin to realize that, oh, well, maybe I do have a soul. And then through this person, you become a believer of having a soul. And then you have a soul. I don't know if I share with you this, this true story. There's this woman, I think it was a nun, maybe not. She had all these visions of Jesus Christ sitting to her, sitting with her and, you know, talking to her and beautiful visions. And one day she gets this migraine headache and it's relentless. And she goes to the doctor, she has an MRI, and the diagnosis is that she has a tumor. And this particular tumor is pushing against a certain part of the brain that is the visual aspect of the brain. And uh, they tell her that if we don't get the tumor out, you will die. But as scientists, as doctors, medical professions, we should also tell you that the visions you've been having for most of your life may be due to this particular tumor pushing against this particular aspect, part of the brain, where it generates all these visions. And because you are a religious woman, uh, the brain has the power to create stories. There's a chance that these visions could stop. Of course, this woman being religious and being a woman of faith says, no, God exists, and these visions are in fact true. My brain is not the creator of these visions or these images. She has to make a choice. Does she want to live or does she want to die? Uh, with her visions and her belief intact? And does she want to live with the possibility of visions coming to stop and then her doubting the visions and her faith? She opts for the second. She does a surgery, she comes out, tumor is gone, she's healthy. 
She no longer has visions. And she's too old to create for herself a new identity. If I'm not religious, if God doesn't exist, if all these visions have been the creation of my, my own brain, my own mind, what should I believe in now? Uh, and if you live in a culture such as this, where it's either or, you know, Indians, the Hindu tradition is neither nor. You're neither good nor bad. It's not like you're either good or bad. In the Western tradition, you're either religious, you're either righteous or a sinner. In Hinduism or in Eastern traditions, you're neither righteous nor a sinner. And then you realize what you have in the Eastern tradition is you can in fact be both. You know, whereas here you're either this or that. I think, you know, there are days where you have sex and it's just meaty. And there are days you have sex and it's filled with love. And if you're mature enough, seasoned enough to know what human nature is all about and the tricks it plays on you, you eventually will get to a place where you accept. Today, I just have sex to release tension. Today, I just have sex because I have this particular erotic desire. And then you accept that. And then tomorrow you go home, you look at your husband, you look at your wife and you love them. When you want to like get access to their soul and the only way you can is by, you know, the act of sex. And so you accept, ex accept the fact that, you know, on Mondays you're a beast and uh, on Tuesdays you're a saint. <laughs> Irania, I'm sorry, your hand was a, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> the West has this desire to ensure things. That seems to be the, the direction we've, we've headed. And, and it's that sureness, like, like discovery negates belief. And you know, it's all discovery. And knowing negates feeling. So it's this push towards sureness that has left that other, other side <coughs> to die with her. Um, and you're saying that, that waffling between the two, waffling that it just has negative connotations, but moving between the two and, and being unsure that either is is right, there's a, there's a value in that, healthiness in that. Yeah, there's a good amount of acceptance that is required, you know. I mean, someone like Kierkegaard wrote this thick, big, fat book about either or, you know. And it's a difficult place to be because the demands imposed upon human beings are just far, far, far too great, you know. Uh, your comments are it's well put because it is part of the scientific revolution, and that's really the task of science. We don't care about the assumptions, we don't care about the belief systems, we just want to pry something open, just look inside it, and give your observations. Uh, you know, I, I, for the longest time, I frowned on drugs because I've never experimented with any of it. And culturally, it's something that's frowned upon. My parents never experimented. I mean, none of, no one in my family. Uh, Would you? I would not, no. I like where I am. I, are there days where I want to feel as opposed to just knowing? Yeah, there are days where I struggle that kind of like if we were to kind of take your question as example, I don't want to just talk about a soul. I want to feel that I do have a soul and I, and I, I rather want, just want to feel it and experience it to the very core of my being. There are days I struggle with it, absolutely. Am I willing to experiment with drugs? No. If on the other hand, I was to find another Hussein and I felt the same way uh, about this new person as I did with Hussein, which is going to be really impossible 
because now I am contaminated by knowledge and experience. And they're going to hold me hostage, so I'm not going to look at another human being as someone who can teach me anything. I'm far too contaminated. <clears throat> if I find someone like that and I grow to love them, have faith in them, trust them, and if they say, Amir, um, this is what you need to do, I will do it. Uh, do you ever trust yourself in that kind of moment you're saying? Trust your teacher, but is there a point where you've asked to take those kind of things and said, okay, I'm going to make a judgment and I'm going to trust my own intuition here and go on? There is always a no. for a past or something else. It depends what you want to experiment with. Um, of course, my biases are always going to contaminate my decisions. And, you know, I've made it this far without resorting to such things, and I think I'm relatively okay. And I'm, uh, to some extent, accepted my faults and my limitations. You know, um, do I have days where I don't trust myself? Absolutely. Uh, do I find ways to escape? No. I just kind of go out there to my kids and my wife say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm crappy today. So if you have any like philosophical questions, don't come to me because I'm not a philosopher. But I think if you're desperate enough, if you have yearning that is, that your um, rationality cannot hone, then you will resort to whatever. You will experiment with whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something. I was going to ask, have you heard of the double slit experiment? I'm sorry? Have you heard of the double slit experiment? Double slit? No. What is it? Oh, it's an experiment where they go electrons at a double slit, and if you're not watching, if you're watching it, it becomes a particle. If you're not watching it, it acts as a wave. Yeah, so I was like, I think science also refers to neither nor not rally. Okay. Similar um, to the cat in the box. Yes. But again, for those of you again who are interested in doing drugs, there are lots of wonderful books out there. Uh, like you know, it's it's good to know the history of drugs and their relationship with human beings. It's good to know the communities in which drugs were uh, an organic part, an integral part of the community. Uh, just to be, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, yeah. given that um, we moved away from the, the spiritual and we're, we're moving into a, not, not, I guess not the spiritual, but more, uh, do you think now that we're at this, like, extremely intellectual stage of our culture, right? Is there a chance that we as a culture are moving through those stages that you talk about through spirituality? Is there a chance that we come to this point where we're like, okay, we, we feel like we figured everything out, and we're still... still okay. Um, there, is a, there is a part of me that grows old naturally. That's the biological part. And then once my body begins to experience old age, it impacts me psychologically. You know, I have less patience, I'm less tolerant of BS, even when like students ask me questions, I interrupt them because I, I can't hear the whole thing. So that, those are natural things. It doesn't need any effort or sacrifice on my part. The sort of evolution you're talking about that requires a great amount of observation, a great amount of sacrifice and time and energy uh, a great amount of reflection once you've observed something to kind of process, figure out what's... That is something that's not organic. That's something that you need to put a great amount of effort, you know. You can't just look at Emerson and say, I understand what it means to be black. That is a maturity that requires a good amount of time, passion, interest, sacrifice. You know, where you're going to go to the library, you check out all these books, you do interviews, and you begin to kind of have certain experiences that may feel uncomfortable for you because you're not, Af you're not black. And so 
<clears throat> you realize for you to understand something, I mean really, really understand it. It's something that requires a good amount of will, passion, understanding. So when you talk about like evolution on a massive cultural level, it will never happen. Growing old, everyone will go through that. Cultures, empires rising and falling, that's organic. But intellectual maturity, spiritual maturity, that's something that requires a great amount of sacrifice and effort. And not very many people have the capacity or have the passion for that. And rightly so, because life is busy. I mean, I mean, the first thing you need to do is just manage your own physical life uh, the best you can. Um, and then it is so complex because at every stage where you grow, you also begin to gain power. Now, that is a new power you're going to have. And with that power, kind of like Spider-Man with powers, uh, responsibility, it takes a while for you to sober up from that power, to kind of say, okay, now I want to have this power, but use it responsibly, you know. And these are all, it's, they take, it has their own stages, you know. Um, and I don't think it's for all, and it should never be for all. I mean, the idea of equality, it's just rubbish. Equal opportunity, that also is rubbish. You know, because what you're doing is fair. Well, it's not fair. Um, no, there is no such thing as fair. Um, I mean, is, is it fair, for example, that someone has walked into this class having declared their major to be psychology and uh, it's the last day or the last class that they need and all of a sudden they say, well, I hate psychology, let me do philosophy. Is it fair? Of course not. Is it fair that... I don't know. I mean, no, there is nothing fair or just about any aspect of life. It's just a war zone. No. Is it fair that someone is just born to be attractive and the rest of us are ugly? No. So what, what, can you, what can you do? Just kill the attractive one. And <laughs> let the rest of the ugly folks live with one another. All right. Well, <laughs> um, have a nice day. Take care. I'll see you soon.